Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simon's like Diamonds back again, talking about trolling motors. We're going to talk about how to select the best trolling motor. Talk about some brands. We've had a, uh, a couple of uh, little things going on the past year with uh, the Pathfinder in terms of troll motor going down and just this whole supply chain issue. Couldn't get parts for months. And maybe you've experienced that and that was frustrating. So we had to change trolling motors and uh, kind of just talk about that whole experience. And uh, But in general, just the uh, some of the pros and the cons and the biggest mistakes that uh, that you can avoid. So we got Wyatt, we got Richard. Got Lukey and uh, and myself, and uh, you got us now for the next hour. You can ask any questions you want as long as we talk about them, because this is not live and you can't ask questions. But you can't ask questions below. So let's let's talk about types first, uh, and just because it could be overwhelming, right? Uh, you know, even we had Barry, who's on our team in the marketing department. He's looking at getting his uh, first boat and. You know, he he started reading. He's like, man, I didn't know, I didn't know about any of this stuff. I didn't, I didn't know there's all these different types and different sizes. And he's like, it, it's overwhelming. And um, he's like, man, he did. Did you know that a, a, a black troll motor is different than a white? And you you, you knew if it was salt or fresh versus you know the the other one just because of the color. Like going on, he's like, wow, that's just crazy. And so I was like, yeah, well, it'd be good to do a podcast on this. So uh, Wyatt, we'll start with you because you're uh, right here uh, next to me, at least on the screen talk about your experiences up so far as a new boat owner and, and just how you picked out uh, the type and maybe any regrets that you might have or things that you've had to change or add on to or take away from. Yeah. So my, uh, my trolling motor journey began very shortly after I got my boat, I was just setting drifts for a while. And I, it, it just got down to the fact that I remember how fishing in the kayak was when I had the pedals and I was able to make micro adjustments and move around. And I knew I needed that in the boat. So I didn't have the money because uh, I had just gotten the boat to go get a big fancy, uh, you know, Altera Minn Kota that deploys itself and, you know, can run a track without me even touching a remote. Uh, so I just decided to start small uh, per Luke's recommendation uh, and just get something that I could kind of learn how to use a trolling motor with. And I think the first thing I'm going to re recommend because this podcast is to teach people uh, is, is to get a small tiller style trolling motor. And I actually went with a uh, freshwater version. Um, it was a Minn Kota Edge. I literally picked it up from Walmart for, I want to say like 200 bucks. Uh, luckily, I'm in an area that there's not a whole lot of current. So I, I was able to get something that was not as powerful as you go up in thrust uh, and, and power. They'd get a little bit more expensive. So folks that may be in the Carolinas or areas that have really heavy tidal flow, you know, pretty much from Northeast Florida up, it's not going to be as easy without spending a little bit more money. But that's what I started with. And also having that tiller handle that I could, as I'm fishing, just like bump it with my hand or, you know, my hip. I joked about that on a podcast not too long ago. Um, but being able to just have that tiller handle to adjust because the remotes can be a little bit overwhelming at first. Now, the downside of, you know, buying that kind of cheap trolling motor to start off with is that number one, it is a freshwater uh, version. And I, st I saw stuff start to corrode really quickly. The bottom got really rusty. Um, the actual cord that you deploy the trolling motor with, uh, for those of you who follow along with my weekly insider reports, you'll know that about two months ago, it completely popped. It, the, the cord that deploys it, like as I was pulling it, broke. And I, every time I wanted to deploy that trolling motor, I had to literally take it off of its screws, put it in the boat, and you know, it, it was a nightmare. So know that when you go with uh, you know, freshwater, saltwater, that it's going to lend itself to longevity of the motor, components not breaking down. Um, but you know, you can start with a freshwater trolling motor to learn what you need out of one and how heavy of a thrust, uh, that you might want. Um, so now I'm upgraded to a Minn Kota Riptide. But so how, how long did this freshwater one last you? Oh, a whole year. Okay. Um, it, it lasted a really long time. And if the cord hadn't broke, uh, maybe if I'd sprayed it down with fresh water more, uh, it, it could have been a different story. And it's very possible I could, I could have just uh, repaired it, but it, it literally got stolen out of my, uh, <laughs> out of my carport when I took it off one day to try and look at it. But, um, it, it, it lasted a pretty good long time for the amount of abuse that I put gear through on a weekly basis. That's pretty good. And so what, and what did you go to next? 
Yeah, so now I have a Minn Kota Riptide, uh, and that's like kind of the starting model for saltwater trolling motors in Minn Kota's line. They've got a, a ton of stuff up from that, uh, but this one's run by a remote. Uh, and it, instead of a cord to pull it, you now have a foot pedal so that you literally would depress in and, and lift the motor up. Um, it's uh, a lot stronger than the one that I had. That was one thing I learned uh, with my, my first trolling motor was even though I'm out on the flats on days where I want to fish, uh, you know, maybe the edge of an intercoastal channel or if I want to go out on a windy day, uh, I need a little bit heavier thrust. But if you're somebody that is able to just pick nice days to go fishing or you're fishing in areas that don't have uh, a lot of wind or heavy current, really the biggest thing was the current. And I remember getting kind of pushed around uh, in the intercoastals where I'd be throwing top waters along the banks. And it was getting a little frustrating having to always mess with the, the speed on my, uh, on my tiller handle. I almost had it turned up all the way for the most part when uh, that current was cranking. So I ended up going with a little bit of a higher thrust. Um, but the biggest change now has been the remote itself. And like I said, it can be overwhelming to somebody that's new to trolling motors. But once you understand the dynamics of how that motor is going to move your specific boat around, uh, you can then learn to use the remote a little bit better because there's some functions on the remote that allow you to kind of set not a course. There are some remotes that will allow you to do that. And I'm sure Richard, uh, I think you've got one that, that, that'll let you do that. And you'll talk on that later, but you can use different functions on some of these higher models that will let you just kind of set a path to, to really drift with the trolling motor. If you're working a bank, it's a lot more efficient than the tiller handle. And then there's less space on the deck that you have to worry about. You know, if that handles there, you're fighting a fish, you bump it. Now your boat's spinning around. You also have the spot lock with those remotes, which is absolutely amazing. Um, there's a lot of cool little features on those Minn Kota's stuff that I haven't even gotten to explore all of yet, because again, this, this new trolling motor is new to me, but, uh, it's, it's a new step up. Um, and, and one that I, I really would recommend for someone that has an idea of how trolling motors work and has used them for a while. Um, but I wouldn't say that going straight to a remote trolling motor would be good for someone that's never used one. I would really recommend starting with a tiller handle. Cool. What about you, Richard? What's the journey? Yeah, so I've used pretty much all of them before, and the boat that I ended up getting was already, you know, basically the Bluetooth with the remote. Um, but with mine, it was not the what they call the iPilot link, so it wasn't connecting to satellites or anything like that. It just had a basic Bluetooth remote, and that was really what I started with and got used to that. And pretty quickly was like, man, it would be really cool to connect to a satellite to where. If I'm messing with a fish, the current, you know, where I'm at, just like what Wyatt was saying, you could be 15, 20 feet away just by looking down and messing with a fish for a few seconds. So it's really important, especially when you're by yourself for a safety reason. Um, the cool thing is with certain Minn Kota, uh, that's what I have. Mine was the Tarova, the saltwater version, and it was already on the boat. Um, they actually sell what they call upgrade kits. So instead of having to go and pay, you know, $3,000 for a huge, you know, brand new troll motor, then get it all installed and all that mess, you can actually just order a kit online. And I'm not very, you know, electrically engineered, you know, anything like that, but I was able to easily just watch a YouTube video, replace the head on it. And all of a sudden I've got a satellite connection and it's much, much cheaper um, than having to worry about a whole new trolling motor. But yeah, that one of the big things, you know, um, going back to like the current scenarios and things like that is, you know, understanding, you know, what, you know, thrust does your boat really need for the type of fishing you do? So if you're only fishing, you know, and, you know, the edges of, you know, smaller bays, you know, back creeks, things like that, you could probably get away with something that, you know, isn't as expensive or really going to have to worry about, you know, all that thrust or even a second battery, which we can get into batteries a little bit later too, because you just don't need as much power. But if you're fishing like where I'm at on the St. John's river or the ICW or places where there's a lot of current, that extra amount of thrust is going to actually let your motor not have to work as hard. Um, as well. So it's really good to go ahead and think about some of those things before you go ahead and purchase, because the last thing you want to do is purchase something that's, I mean, even $500, it doesn't matter. And then quickly realize it's not going to work out for you. Um, but yeah, so where I'm at, I really like the 
Um, you know, I, I have about an 80 pound thrust trolling motor now and it works and I've got a 19 foot boat. It's kind of a hybrid between a flats and a bay boat. Um, and it works great with the current. So, um, you know, but if I had a Carolina skiff or something like that, a little bit smaller, you could get away. I have a buddy who's got a, a J16 and he's got all the power he needs on a single 12 volt system and a 50 uh, pound thrust or 55 pound thrust. And he can go all day on that thing. So definitely some good things to think about. Cool. Yeah. And we'll talk about the batteries and, and thrust here in a little bit. That's uh, good. Luke, you know, you've been all over the place and still have, well, you got three troll motors in uh, your position. Yeah, three working right ones and uh, a couple of non-working. I've gone through a lot over the years and, and, and the, the number one, I mean, troll motors are by far the most important accessory to have on a boat. Just throw it out there. That's why it's important enough to, to talk about it like this. Um, if you're going to be inshore fishing, a troll motor opens up so many doors. It is well worth every penny and is way more important than anything else like, like push or a power poles, um, fish finders. It is the number one thing to think about. Deodorant, and, anything. It just beats. Yeah, way more worth deodorant. Yeah. Of course. Um, and, and then also it is Sun, important. sunscreen why <laughs> also important to, to match it to the, and just like what, what Wyatt and Richard have said, match it to the boat that you're fishing from and the type of fishing that you're doing. Very important. Um, the good news is that the, there is a lot of variability, right? You can get, you can, you can pair a lot of, uh, troll motors with, the, with one boat. So you don't have to find like the exact perfect one. You don't have to spend two years researching the, the, the purchase, just make sure that it's in in the ballpark and and i've used motor guides i've used motor guides more than anything now we have uh some encodas and uh and the good news there is they both work right uh, one is it noticeably uh better than the other um and and it's really just about the most important thing is just pairing it i think the tiller versus the the electronic is an important decision that's going to be a big costly decision if you go from a tiller to the the ipilots um and if you're using a skiff, right, I, I still have the tiller on my skiff because it is an actual benefit to have it. You can get up in the shallow water more quietly and navigate more quietly because you can manually do the very soft, slight adjustments around those spooky fish up in the shallows. So if you're on a skiff, I, I would whether you're new or advanced, I would recommend the tiller just because it, if it is actually really good, it's, a, it's beneficial for sight fishing up in the shallows. For bay boats, now that um, we have the, the smart motor, we'll call it, that has the spot lock capabilities, that is the biggest game changer that there ever has been in trolling motors, in my opinion. So if you're in a bay boat and you're fishing a lot of deeper water, um, even if you're new, I would almost say to, and, you can, and it's in the budget, having that spot lock is a game changer. It's worth the frustration at first to, to learn how to to uh to navigate the remote because the benefits of your fishing a bridge or any other deep structure the the ability to be able to just hit a button and and know that the boat is going to stay in one spot offsets all of the frustrations you'll have when you have to learn the remote because it is a pain um but it is it is a game changer the reason why i don't like spot lock for shallow water and that's the biggest mistake i see people make is that they're going down a flat no i want to stay in this one spot and they hit the spot lock and that'll have a big pulse of water going, uh, you know, basically the direction that you were going, and that'll just spook every fish on the flat. But uh, but that that pulse doesn't, you know, that can be managed as long as you're aware with it. But um, but the risk of spooking fish in the deeper water isn't really that great. So for for bay boats and you fish a lot of deeper like docks and bridges, that spot lock feature is it is a, and reefs too. I mean, that's the biggest game changer that, that has come to the market anytime since I've been using them at least. Yeah. The analogy is cruise control in, in a vehicle, right? And we've all done it. You put it on cruise control, set it at 80, going down the interstate and all of a sudden you go up a hill and, you know, the engine wants to keep up to 80, but it's got to work hard. And all of a sudden, mm, you know, you kind of wakes you up and the same thing happens, you know, in a, in a boat. Uh, and, and that's Luke's point is that that could literally spook uh, the fish and, and, and it will, uh, even, it can get even the motor, even the motor turning, like, turn, even yeah. turning the motor, like I've had it on when you're up in shallow calm water, even just zzz, like a little small switch, you can see wake start shooting off. 
But if you had the tiller and you just barely move it and you can just gradually change the speed, they, they think it's a boat that's, you know, that's way away. They're used to buzzing sounds off in a distance, um, but they can feel a pulse. And if they feel that pulse, and they can tell it's close. They're, they're gone. And so I would say that's, that's definitely the biggest mistake people make with trolling motors, particularly spot lock and shallow water should not go while fishing should not go hand in hand. Good. So I think, you know, the bigger question that we see a lot is someone's got a boat and has no troll motor and first they're deciding troll motor power pole. And we always say troll motor all day long without even thinking about it. Even before you do anything else, any other accessory, get it. Then like, all right, what, what size do I get? Right. What brand, what size, like how much thrust do I need? Do I need one, two, 10 batteries? What, how, what are your, what do you say when someone says, all right, I have a X foot boat, 18, 24, 26, 21, whatever. What, what do you, how are you guiding them into getting the right thing without sitting there and going to the dealership with them? Well, I, I would say, see what the dealers like go. Every boat's different. It's it, obviously based on weight and, and everything. I would say, see what they're putting on new boats for whatever you have. And that's probably a pretty good idea. If they're, if they have 24 volt troll motors on the new boats of whatever model you're using, probably a pretty good idea to, to get a, 20, a 24 volt. Um, but like a, like a small, like a J16, that was my first boat. And that's why as like a 12, uh, just one battery is more than enough with a 50 pound troll motor. That thing will, you can, you can have a legit wake behind the boat. <laughs> We don't go all day he's pulling, long. He's pulling water skiers. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, but, but with the, like, we now have a, a 24 foot bay boat, the, the Pathfinder, that would, that would totally get owned by even like a five mile an hour wind. And, and so I think the smartest thing that's all encompassing is just like, hey, like, just call, see what, what they're selling for the boat you have or something similar. And that's going to be a pretty good idea of, of the, the power you need. So let's talk about, so Richard, you said 80 pounds thrust yep and uh, a big reason for that too is you know what type of area you're fishing in as well um you know i'm it's always windy here of course but you know we have huge tide swings and big you know current uh drops as well so that water can be moving you know sometimes over three knots i mean it, it can really scream so that's definitely something to take into account you know and another thing is if you know, you're doing a lot of, especially, you know, Luke, your bay boats, those guys will go and do a lot of near shore fishing, but man, that having that spot lock is awesome. But I know guys have gone, you know, both, they've put an undersized motor on it and then they completely burn their motor out, you know, in a trip. Um, so it's really important to know kind of the situations that you think you're going to be using it in the most and then kind of applying it to that. So like I said, I have an 80 pound thrust for my bow and roughly weight wise, just so people can, you know, understand, um, probably with the motor 1500 pounds or so at most, um, 13 to 15, but an 80 pound thrust does very well here in high current areas and situations. And it's a 24 volt, um, because, you know, sometimes if I'm fishing around jetties or something like that, I need that extra battery because it can burn up really quickly. Yep. And if you guys don't know Richard, or if you're listening and say, I, I don't know Richard yet, uh, he's in that uh, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, you know, all throughout that area where they do have some pretty big, uh, pretty big tidal swings. So why, what about you? What, what size and uh, what, what are in your boat as well? Your skiff? Yeah. So I have a Carolina skiff J 16 uh, makes you think the boat would be 16 foot, but it's actually 15.5. Um, and the main yeah, round, code round ahead, up, man, round up just yeah. like, just like height, right? <laughs> yeah. Five, um, ten and a half. No, five, 11, five, 11. <laughs> so um, the, <laughs> the Minn Kota edge uh, was a 30 pound thrust and I would burn that up almost every single trip when I went out um, on the flats here in Texas. Again, we've got not a whole lot of current movement. Like a big swing for us is like a foot and a half. Um, I remember being in the Carolinas and that, that trolling motor wouldn't have made it two hours in those creeks. Uh, now that I've got the Minn Kota, uh, Riptide, it's uh, a little bit stronger. I want to say it's 60. Uh, and I, that's, a, it's a lot overpowered for that little J 16. I just had somebody that was, uh, that was selling it and I knew I could fit it on my boat, um, for, you know, $200 when it's a basically thousand dollar motor, I got a pretty good steal on it. So I went ahead and overpowered a little bit, uh, but I, I felt like that was okay. Um, another, 
Another thing is the battery consumption. Uh, I did have that 12 volt, like Luke said on the J16, you only need a 12 volt for smaller thrust motors. But now that this is a 24 volt, I had to take two 12 volt batteries and, and rig them in a series, which if you don't know a whole lot about electrical stuff, it can, it can start kind of becoming a pain uh, unless you want to have to pay someone to install your trolling motor. So uh, the, the thrust capability for my J16, I'd say somewhere probably 50 would be good for, you know, a smaller skiff that that's pretty light and it's a flat bottom skiff. Um, so it, it glides pretty well, but now with, uh, with this 60 pound thrust, I can almost get on plane. Um, so definitely overkill bump it down. I would say if you've got a craft similar size to mine. Well, Luke, what about your, uh, but the Maverick and the Pathfinder, what size? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of troll motor fishing, especially on the skiff. It's basically, I do a, a lot of power fishing. And so I rely on the troll motor a lot. So I, I went up a level. And so it's a 17 foot uh, Maverick skiff, which is, it's made, it's a light boat. Um, I have, uh, I guess it's 80, a little over 80 pound thrust or so in there. So it's a 24 volt and that thing goes, it'll, it'll go all day long too. So, so that's been great for the skiff, uh, could be lower and it would still do this fine. And on the, on the uh, Pathfinder, it's a much heavier boat. And so we have a three battery system, so 36 volt. And I believe that's like 112 pounds or 115 pound thrust. And, uh, and that'll, that, again, that works great too. That'll go all day long. And, um, and obviously the more you use it, the, the more you want to kind of go up a level. Um, but that being said, it doesn't have to be like exactly perfect. There's, um, there's a lot of give and take, if you will. And, and didn't we change size on, uh, on that last yeah. one? Yeah. So the, so I've always used motor guides, uh, at least for the last long time. I love them. They've been great. And, uh, and, and we got a motor guide on the Pathfinder. I still have the motor, by, motor guide on the, on the skiff. The, um, we basically ended up burning up the, uh, the, the motor guide on, on the Pathfinder and something happened with it. And it was right in the middle of COVID where, it was impossible to get parts. So we're out of it. We're out of a troll motor there for like three months. Couldn't even find any troll motor on the market. Technically, we needed a 60 inch shaft. That's what came with the boat. And, and per the research to where they have the recommended shaft lengths for the, the height of the transom above the water, we technically fit in this 60, uh, 60 inch shaft um, range and just could not find one. And finally found a 72 inch shaft troll motor and just went ahead and bought it okay like it might not be the right size shaft hopefully it'll work and uh and even though we went with a longer shaft length than was recommended it still works great and so i'm really happy we did it um it's actually a benefit for reef fishing is one uh, one thing that i learned if you are going to be doing a lot of reef fishing and you get the the recommended length right based on the transom that recommendation isn't really set for a lot of wave activity. So if you're going to be doing some reef fishing, knowing you're going to be out on some swells and you want to keep position, if that trolling motor is getting bumped out of the water on the, on the swell, you're going to, first of all, make a lot of noise. And then secondly, you're probably going to chew up, you know, just burn up the trolling motor too. It's not good for that blade to be, to be blasting out of the water. And, uh, and so now we have an extra foot of shaft length. So that enables us to now get out there on the reefs on, on relatively choppy days and still hold position, which is a huge benefit. But the con of going too long of, of a shaft is that now fishing the flats, if we need to raise it to get the, you know, the, the troll motor away from the grass up in shallow water, now we've got to cast over this troll motor that's almost <laughs> like looking at you in the face. <laughs> you so, really do have to cast. And it looks so big because it's yeah. got the auto deploy and it goes all the way up and then down. It's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, like skip casting, like you really can't skip cast over. You got to like go over. It's, it's weird. But again, it's really about usage, right? So if you're doing a lot of reef fishing, you can care less about how high it is when you're when you're flats fishing. And then but if you're only going to do shallow water fishing, you can care less on on handling big, big swells. So a lot of it's on usage. Uh, but again, the good news is even if you're off a little bit, um, it'll still work. It'll still get the job done. Yep. Um let's talk about mounting as well because why you talked about you know doing it yourself and people say all right do i do it right or left side what, what am i doing and then you got to also think about you know where do you want these holes it's kind of sucks if you have to move them like we had that issue right luke where the front cleat you can't even open it you can't it's not even usable uh because it's it's just i mean it's covered up like by an inch 
from uh, the main mount. It's like, that's a little bit frustrating. So talk about any experiences or lessons learned on, on mounting these bad boys. So I would say probably the biggest thing you want to make sure of is that when that motor's deployed, number one, the shaft isn't touching the gunwale or your boat. It's not going to be rubbing against anything uh, if you are mounting it yourself. Secondly, when it does deploy, it's as close to the center of the bow as possible because that's going to help when you're actually navigating with the trolling motor that your boat's not swinging off to one side or the other. If you have that trolling motor just kicking the left side of your boat uh, because you've got it mounted too far to the left, your boat is not going to track properly. Uh, the, the trolling motor needs to be in the very center of the bow for it to work well. So you have to kind of almost mount it at an angle. Um, if you obviously put it directly straight center on the bow. Most folks fish right on the center of their bow standing standing there. So it, it, it does kind of take up uh, a position, but you need to, to mount it to where that shaft's gonna come down in the center. Um, and then obviously you can turn it around with the remote or the tiller and it'll, it'll be fine. Um, I would say that a stainless steel um, hardware, definitely really important. I went with regular steel for the <laughs> the the freshwater the version. freshwater version yeah so when i i well i used what came with the kit not thinking about how it was going to rust and not picking up uh, the, the salt water hardware so when i was taking you know some of the mounting plates off uh it was much more difficult um but also you don't want to have rust stains on your boat so use stainless steel hardware uh and then Lastly, always think about where your, your battery source is going to be and how those wires are going to be getting from your motor to the actual, um, the, the hull of the boat, usually where your batteries are going to be. So I've got a forward hatch that I use and I put my batteries in. Uh, and big tip here, uh, if you are running a small skiff, put those batteries as close to the center of your boat as possible. If you put the batteries off to the left side of your skiff, your skiff is never going to run right on plane because if you use some of the lighter skiffs like J16 or small Maverick, something like that, those batteries have significant weight, those big 12 volts. So it'll throw off how your skiff rides. There's a lot, I mean, I could go into this kind of stuff for like an hour because I made a lot of mistakes doing it. But uh, those would be some of the biggest things is like be very conscious of where your power source is going to be and how your wiring set up so it doesn't get wet um and, and where all the weight is going to be and, and that everything is mounted to where that motor is going to track right it's not going to rub on the boat um and yeah definitely stainless steel hardware and, and i'll throw just just for rust prevention too this is something i used my first boat it was it was again that skiff and it came with a freshwater trolling motor and i didn't have the funds to to get anything else so i was like all right i'll just, I'll just keep using it until it, it croaks and, uh, but what I did is I just, I just sealed everything with silicone, like every, every screw that I could see. And most importantly, the, the connection where the, um, you know, the, it connects to the boat, the, the troll motor cord to the boat itself. That's what, uh, w when it first died, it was just a, a lot of corrosion happened in there. So I was like, heck, I forgot to silicone that. And I, I never took it off. I, I just stored it with the troll motor on. So I just sealed the, the connection with this silicone. And that thing lasted three years. I sold it. I sold that boat with the same troll and that thing was still kicking. So um, even if you don't have the right hardware, um, you know, this, this silicone, even if you do have the right hardware, rust that saltwater just wrecks stuff. So for people listening, what do you have? It's a 3M oh, sorry, marine it's, grade. It's, yeah, this marine grade sealant. It's just silicone sealant. It goes on clear. And, and so that way you can, you can be pretty aggressive with it and it's not going to look unsightly. And then if you do have to peel it off, like when, whenever I do, unpower it i just peel it off and the silicone comes right up and it, it looks like it never even was there so it's been a very that's certainly saved me a ton of money over the years it's just silicone those connections especially and if you are splicing wires always use the heat the heat shrink stuff that is a game changer as well um so protect the wires long story short richard what about you any mounting mistakes or just general things that you wish someone had told you uh luckily no mistakes yet um but a, a few big things to keep in mind i know why it touched on it but you know when you mount that you know motor in the front or the bow a lot of times especially like Minn Kota, you know the kind of platform or base is what almost two feet long it's pretty dang big so something that you need to do is kind of angle it to where it's still going to move that shaft of that motor into the front of your boat 
but you can do a full 360 with it and it's not going to hit any part of your you know bow or the crest of the bow because i've seen that happen so many times especially you know those those shafts they do have a little bit of flex in them not much but a little bit and if you are really you know going hard on one of those things it could move back an inch or more easily and if you don't account for that ahead of time you could be hitting you know your boat with with the blades and that's a that's a that's a bad deal the other thing is too you know with a lot of the newer boats you know one a lot of them already have connections that are made for you in the front of the bow um so that's good to think about too on you know placement for wiring and stuff like that because the last thing you want is a big wire going across the front of your boat you know because hook anything that can get hooked on it will get hooked on it um, and then lastly, a lot of boats now, um, the, the dealers kind of actually have recommendations on where to actually place your batteries, especially if it's like a 24 or even 36. Um, and, you know, if, if you can, usually it's better the closer to the front of the boat you can get typically is better. Um, I know why I was saying in the center, that's absolutely necessary. But many times if you can move it to one of your front hatches, um, that will really help you out a lot because you got to think most of your weight is going to be in the back with your motor and it'll really help you plane off a little bit better and faster too. That's good. Do any of you guys have um, like that protector? I don't even know the link on the name of it that prevents it from just slamming up and down either while you're you know trailering it or if you're hitting waves, do you guys have that? No. Let it ride. Right, because yeah. I know yeah, Hollywood. I, I think I think some of the guides have it just from use and abuse every day and hitting just waves. And I noticed Hollywood. I think Deeks had one that was similar. Yeah, and the the longer the shaft too. So Hollywood definitely has the seventy two inch shaft on the mm -hmm. Babo similar. So he he went up up a level just again because he does a lot of shark fishing and stuff. All, all, you know, off um, offshore and. Um, and yeah, so the longer it is, the more, the more it's going to be flexing as you're going over wakes and stuff. Uh, we, we have the 72 and let it go. It's definitely, it's definitely bumping around a little bit, but it's, it's, it seems fine so far. So definitely, it definitely won't hurt. Um, but I don't think it's required unless you're doing some hardcore running and like really big seas a lot. So I do have a tip there that I got from one of the guys that runs a trolling motor shop here. Uh, if you are using like the Minn Kotas that get deployed by the foot pedal where you, where you push it in uh, and then step down, uh, those have a tendency to fail or even as they get older, <clears throat> the motor will release off of them with a significant amount of pressure. Uh, even when you're trailering your boat, if you come to a hard stop, you know, you're trying to prevent rear ending somebody, you go to a uh, hard enough stop, that motor can actually come up and deploy and that bracket that cinches um, further up the shaft uh, where you can actually set the depth of your trolling motor um, when you're on a flat or, or whatnot. Uh, he recommended that you take that piece down while you're moving your boat or maybe even if you are in some really bad chop uh, to, to throw that all the way down and lock that motor to where that collar sits on top of that slot so that the motor will never deploy even if the foot pedal comes loose. You're not going to wreck it by, you know, being on plane, having your trolling motor get ripped off the front of your boat or it comes out in the middle of a, you know, uh, auto deal. Uh, but uh, it's it, it was a pretty cool tip that I've started to utilize and it makes me feel a lot safer when I'm, I'm moving around with my motor. So yeah, if you, if you read the uh, train, the user's manual, it was it says that as well. So that's a uh, yeah, like I, I, I said, don't agree with that. <laughs> mine secondhand. There was no user's manual, man. Yeah. That's a, that's an important thing. And, and, uh, and another two that I didn't realize because I didn't read the, the I'm, I'm not making fun of why it is myself is uh, an important thing too. That'll, that'll elongate the lifespan of the troll motor is when you are charging it, it is important to actually unplug it, uh, to have to, for some reason, there's some, some sort of issue. I didn't believe it at first. And so I never, I never bothered doing it. Cause I, again, I sealed, I sealed my connection. I literally sealed it so that I wouldn't unplug it. Uh, but I had a trolling motor. It was, it was a, a motor guide. It was a great white that uh, that was my favorite trolling motor. But I, all of a sudden, the the paint was coming off of it like pretty early in a, in its life, and it, it had to do with with it being plugged in as it was charging. Somehow, some energy gets in there, and it'll really wreck some of the uh, the circuitry. In some cases, in my case, the uh, the paint. So uh, so it is important to unplug it or at least have some sort of. Many boats have. Uh, on off switch for the trolling motor um, and just make sure that it's off when you are when you are charging it because that that energy can can do some damage 
Or it could have been that's... Otis just peeing on it. Yeah, I can't rule that out. Can't rule it out. But <laughs> but again, and that sort of stuff will be in the in the uh, the owner's manual, um, just so you can know exactly what to do to make sure that it has the the longest lifespan possible. Cool. Any tips on uh, remotes? Making sure you maybe have backup batteries. Like a lot of these brand new ones, like remote don't work. You're kind of out of luck. Uh, not much. You, so any tips? Or you guys had any bad experiences with? remotes jamming up or freezing up or anything yeah so fortunately if you can you can get what's called just a backup remote um even if you have the fancy the iPilot, all that stuff um one that kind of looks like this say you're careless and drop that in the water you can actually still get the little tiny one it's it's super simple it's got you know four different functions on it and you can't do all the same stuff as a satellite but i think they're like 50 bucks and it is definitely worth the insurance um just to have it with you and at least you know not have your entire day completely ruined um it's just good to have on the boat with you but yeah i always carry one of those little little ones like that and they're bluetooth so they work as well it's good it'll probably also work with any samsung tv as well yep. why what you got you're about to say something yeah, so I was I was actually fishing a tournament one time, and uh, we we were using one of those Minn Kotas that had the remote. And I remember the battery died, and we were just like, "Oh my gosh, what do we, we?" It just wasn't even something that that we thought of. Um, I, it was a brand new trolling motor for him as well, and we didn't even know that the remote had a battery in it. It's not even thinking; it wasn't on our our mind frame. So I would recommend always having some extra, yeah having some extra batteries on the boat so that you're ready and you don't have to, you know, go run to a ramp and uh, go to the store and, and get some batteries for your trolling motor in the middle of a tournament. Um, always have extra ones on board for sure. And seal up the compartment of your, your, uh, your remote. When I, when I first got this trolling motor, I was handed the remote that got by the guy I bought it from. And uh, when I went to go use it, I couldn't figure out why the trolling motor wasn't working, why I couldn't get it to turn. Some of the functions worked, some of them didn't. And I had popped new batteries in there. What had happened was because the back of the remote had gotten wet, had gotten salt water on it, it had fried some of the circuitry when I took it to this trolling motor place. That's where you guys I just got that cool collar tip from. Uh, and it was literally just the remote that wasn't working um, because it had gotten wet. And he recommended to throw some, you know, electricians tape over the back of it uh, where that ceiling is. So try to make sure uh, to the best of your ability that you're making sure that remote doesn't get wet, but that you have it sealed as well because that it can get to be a very expensive a repair and fix those remotes are not cheap good yeah. i'll just throw in the importance of, of when storing the remotes make sure like i keep it all in a in a plastic baggie so i just keep it all sealed even and in a in a storage spot that that doesn't have uh, much water intrusion just because like as white said if that remote has any sort of electrical issues it'll it'll you, you'll be you'll be useless if the good thing about the tillers is that there's it's not as nearly as fancy, but it's a workhorse and there's not nearly as many things that can go wrong, uh, which makes it just, which I, why I love it for the skiff. Uh, but having that remote sure is nice for the bay boats. It just comes with some added, added cons of just making sure to take care of it. And, and even with the batteries, have extra batteries, keep them in a Ziploc bag, like keep everything as sealed as you possibly can. And I haven't had a remote go bad yet, but I have uh, been in an instance, maybe more than one, where I get out to my spot and I realize that re my remote is here. So the uh, we now have the Ultera, um, and that one it's a it's a remote that you charge up. So I'd have it here charged up, hooked up onto my computer to to get charged, and it would still be here at my desk when I'm out of the water. And so I would just say, if you're like me, and sometimes you get anxious and and you're get in a hurry to go out there fishing, is if you bring the remote inside, like tie it on or clip it onto the keys to the boat so that you literally cannot go without the remote because it's i don't charge it up after every trip so it's one of those things that it's not on my like to every trip uh checklist so like if you are going to bring it in like make sure that you don't leave without it because the, the bad thing about those fancy trolling motors is if you don't have the remote you don't have a trolling motor and uh and so just take care of it and make sure not to forget it, it would be uh be my my two things that's good um, on the fishing side, we kind of talked about it already in terms of spooking fish. Any other tips on just using them and assuming that someone now has theirs picked out? Uh, what are some of the mistakes that anglers are making with their trolling motor? 
that are uh, that are hurting their fishing. I mean, besides deploying it and letting it slam, uh, I think just that erratic, right? Anytime, whether you get the, the tiller or not, I mean, and I've done it before, right? On accident, I hit it the wrong way. We're doing stuff, we're trying to get out and like, ah, like that, that literally just will destroy a spot. Yeah. I'll just say as far as using it, just know that it's just like with docking a boat or anything, you don't, you, is, you don't want to go really fast until you have to stop and stop right there immediately. Every, just do everything slowly. Like every, every, every motion should be smooth, like plan, plan ahead. Right. If you need to be 20 feet up, don't just, just charge it full speed and then stop it at 20 feet. Right. Just go just a nice slow movement up to, up to the area and glide into it. So I guess do is the, the least amount of movements possible to get to where you need to be, I guess would be the, the biggest mistake that, that many people make. Yeah, I would agree. Less is more for sure. I think the best way to use a trolling motor is just to allow it to put you in a position to drift. Um, that being said, if you have a day where your drift, you're having to constantly adjust it by turning it on, turning it off, it's way better to not have it running, but it's worse to be constantly kicking it on and off. Um, so there's, there's a balance that you have to find there because if like Luke said, fish are used to like a buzzing, but if you're kicking it up, kicking it down, turning it around all the time, um, that's going to spook them more than if you were just at a constant speed that was slower and you were moving, you know, at a, at a, at a defined pace. Uh, so ideally when I use my trolling motor, I'm setting up where I can kind of drift with wind and I can make a slight adjustment if I need to move out from a shoreline or closer in, or I see a patch of potholes, you know, and I drift over it with the trolling motor completely off. That's the stealthiest way to do it. But uh, if I, if it's just getting hard to set drifts, what I'll do is uh, I'll keep it on the lowest setting I can to stay in control of the boat. Uh, but I don't turn it off uh, and turn it back on because that kicking up of speed is always, always, always going to spook fish. Yeah. And, you know, in your kind of high current areas, like we have over here in the Atlantic and stuff like that, one thing that will help a ton of not spooking fish is going into the current. One, you have way better boat control um, because if you're going with the current, that current can grab the back of the boat and start turning it, believe it or not. And then you're going way too fast. Uh, and you're having to do that kind of sharp jerky motion with it and you're spooking fish the whole way. Plus you're not even throwing, you know, in the right direction as well. So going into the current's huge. And another thing with, you know, you know, people and folks who've got the kind of the iPilot or the satellite, uh, you know, type of trolling motors, I can connect and do that. Spot lock is awesome. Don't get me wrong, but man, it will spook fish like crazy. So what I mean, you know, is if you're going into an area, I've done it before where, I'm going and then I'll shut off or immediately hit spot lock. And what happens is you're still drifting from that initial, uh, you know, push that you were going on. So what'll happen is that motor will do like a 180, and before you know it, the boat spin around and it takes a minute to calculate the wind and current and where that's going with the boat. So a super cool feature and probably one of the best is gonna be this little button right here. It's got the little north arrow on it. This thing is awesome because what you can do with that is it's technically not spot lock, but if you can position your boat into the current and while you hit that, it'll put you on a, a certain azimuth. So even if you're at like a one or two, what you do is you're kind of matching or going against the speed of that current, you know, and it's basically putting you in a spot lock position, but that way, you know, the spot lock motor isn't going all crazy or, doing those, you know, big thrust on the left and the right to keep you in that exact spot. This is actually even better. It keeps you on an azimuth, but what will happen is it does micro adjustments versus the big hard adjustments to immediately get you back over kind of in your spot. So that was a really good tip I learned because I was like, man, I am spooking a ton of fish right now. So I started doing that and it helps a lot. Good job. I and mean, great job on the azimuth word. Uh, Justin would be proud. You got your $5 word in, snuck yeah. it into the end. Oh yeah, I was, I was just about to say yeah. The, if you're using the remote, the two most important bo buttons, the two most valuable buttons are that north button, the in, and the and the spot lock. And and yeah, as Richard said, uh, never hit that spot lock, especially if you're in shallow water and you actually want to fish that spot. Never hit it until you've actually got the boat to actually stay exactly where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. 
You don't get spot lock to, to, to on a drift. But that north button, I use it when fishing docks. A lot of the docks here are, are, are pretty much in a straight line. And all, all I do is I just get the boat going in the right heading that I want to go down. I hit that little north button and that'll automatically keep the boat going in that same trajectory. So if the wind is taking you one way and the currents go another, you don't need to worry about it because the, the motor is going to automatically pivot and go right exactly where you want to go. And so one tip too, patrol motors. Dude, is that, that is it your stomach or the dog? That's Otis. He wants to go outside. <laughs> so, so one tip too, Otis pipe down, buddy. Uh, one, one tip for using the troll motor is to have the motor down, the big motor down. You need that rudder so that the boat's not doing a bunch of fish tailing. So uh, if you have the motor up, the boat's liable to do a bunch of uh, fish tailing. Sorry, the stinking dog. And, uh, and that's going to just make you have to make a bunch of adjustments. And every time you touch that troll motor, as, as we mentioned earlier, you're going to have an increased odds of spooking fish. So I'm going to let that dog out real quick. Yeah, well, he has a good dinosaur. We'll end it here. Uh, unless you guys have anything else, I'm sure we'll get some other questions. We, could, we might even be able to do a whole other episode of just talking about the remotes and uh, and all the little tricks on there, maybe like an on the water one. So uh, let us know what questions that you have when it comes to trolling motors. And um, as always, you know, we take our members comments and questions first. And of course, you can do that in the community if you have any uh, questions. And then after that, it'll be on saltstrom.com on the actual blog, which is in the fishing tip section. Those comments come directly to us. And then finally, YouTube. So basically, if you don't want a good chance of us seeing your comment, put it on YouTube. If you want a really high chance of us seeing and replying to your comment, put it in the community and or the blog post, uh, which is where we try to direct uh, everyone as this thing has grown now with 30,000 members. And wait till you guys see the software that we have coming out. Wyatt just got a little sample and oh my gosh it's i mean it's going to enable you to delete all of your other fishing apps meaning it'll have everything you need from the wind and the weather and the tides and now gps spots and radar and sonar and then a couple other little surprises uh, we've got all these different chart layers you can now track everything basically your journal if you're in a, doing like a log book i mean it literally has everything you can imagine in one place uh, I've been working on this for a while and uh, it's coming soon. So uh, insiders, that'll be for insider members. We're going to give it uh, for free, at least in the beginning. Uh, either we're going to do that and or raise prices or charge separately, but all current insider members will get it completely for free and, and will not ever have any prices go up on them. That's part of our guarantee to our members. So get in now while you can at saltstrong.com. That is uh, going to be game changing. We'll have a podcast uh, very soon, if not already. We might even sneak one in if uh, if you're listening to this and saying, hey, I just saw that the other day. Uh, we might even sneak it in if, uh, if we can. I know Nick Nick is behind the scenes just making sure it's just right before he, he, see, he shows anything that uh, that we've gotten to see behind the scenes. So appreciate you guys. Uh, any final words, gents? I think we about covered it all. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Super helpful. Cool. Well, troll motor your way uh, all the way home, and uh, we will talk to you guys in the next episode. Peace. We out. Whoop, whoop. See ya.